is the campaign lead for our assessment and analysis campaign. Pat? All right. Well, I hope everybody's refreshed after that short halftime break, um, even though I think we were slightly into the third quarter when we took it. So, uh, you know, it's been a great day so far. And, you know, I just took a few notes. I got my little cheat sheet up here. And, you know, so far today I've had conversations during the break on optics, medical research, materials, manufacturing, networks, and cyber, okay, that diversity of technical areas. Talked about international partners with the folks outside, industry partners, universities, and then state government also. So when you think about it, to me that's the real beauty of an event like this, is you bring people together from dis different disciplines, and sometimes solving hard problems isn't necessarily the technology, it's how the people actually solve problems, and by looking at different disciplines and talking to different folks and understanding how difficult problems are solved, you can move forward in leap ahead ways rather than evolutionary ways. So thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk to you, uh, start a dialogue if you will, about collaboration and analysis and assessment campaign for ARL. I'm gonna go through briefly the campaign, talk about our taxonomy, talk about the people, uh, highlight some of our unique facilities, and then also maybe give you a flavor, just a flavor of what we do in this campaign to get you know, the more in-depth full meal. Uh, go upstairs, go all the way back, to where lethality and protection is and hang a left instead of a right. And um, you'll see uh, room 17 and 18 uh, have analysis and assessment back there. So what is the analysis assessment campaign? We discover, innovate, and transition in the area of analytical sciences and assessment techniques. Um, a good portion of this supports the Army in material development. But unlike most of the other ARL campaigns, we're not as squarely in material development because we really are an assessment campaign. A lot of our effort, if you look at this pyramid, supports test and evaluation as well as material development. It supports combat development as well as test and evaluation. And of course, it supports the Army's analysis community as well as the other three. So we view this campaign, if you will, as an important bridge, a bond, if you will, between the material development s and communities, the test and evaluation communities, the requirements definition, and all the different types of analysis that the Army uses today and will use into the future. On the right-hand side, I talk a little bit about a paradigm for analysis and assessment. Typically, when you think about analysis, you think about large data sets, crunching numbers, but it's much, much more than that. The problems we're trying to analyze, the things we're trying to assess, don't occur frequently in the commercial world. Okay? And when we're out there in the real world, in the real operational environment, we're typically not there to make measurements. We're there to fight. We're there to win our wars. So we have to develop a sound methodology when we do these assessments, a methodology that has a level of rigor, a level of validation and verification so that we can believe in an objective, independent manner the results that we're giving to our senior leadership. To do this, we have to develop experimentation, you know, techniques to measure things that are in very extreme, whether they be extreme in the physical sense, extreme in the cyber sense, perhaps. So we have to make measurements that are very difficult to measure. And then, of course, it all has to be underpinned with the third leg of the stool, which is a rigor that allows us to do that assessment, a rigor in mathematics and a rigor in the analytical approach. What I want to leave you with at the end of my talk and the rest of today and tomorrow as you talk to our folks is three things. First of all, you'll understand why A and A is important to the Army, but hopefully through the dialogue, we'll understand why A and A is important to you and that'll help us to collaborate. You'll get a better understanding of some of our value streams. Our people, our number one value stream. Okay? Our unique facilities, we, we do have a lot of data. It's not all about the data, but we have a lot of data in a lot of different areas. So hopefully you'll get a flavor of the types of data that we collect, the types of data we have, and maybe we'll see some opportunities there for sharing some of that data to make both of our lives a little easier. And then finally, we've got some challenging problems. Um, they are somewhat unique uh, to the Army, but we know they overlap uh, with some, some other problems that other folks have in the commercial world and, and beyond as well. So uh, by looking at challenging problems, there'll be areas to collaborate. And then finally, the number one reason we're here is you know, to learn from each other. Don't be the uh, guy in the lower left-hand corner with your fingers in your ears and just talking. All right, let's learn, let's you know, free our minds, get together over a cup of coffee and a napkin, and create some ideas, and then we'll use some of Tom Malkern's tools that he talked about, okay, and develop some collaboration mechanisms. 
So why does the Army care about analysis and assessment? Well, first of all, the data we generate out of this campaign supports the Army's independent and objective analysis and evaluations of all the material that we put out in the field for our warfighters. Okay, we don't want to wait until it's in the field to figure out if it works, so we go through developmental tests, operational tests, and make sure that the equipment works. Secondly, we generate data that looks at how a threat interacts with the system when we feed these data to other Army analysis communities, other Army analysis organizations, which then get rolled up ultimately in the force on force simulation so we can understand how the Army will perform in a campaign. Third, we started something new within the Army at the direction of a very senior Army leadership. We're now starting to take these tools and look at equipment, at technologies while they're early in development, understand where they may be susceptible to emerging and future threats, understanding you know, what that risk is, and then feeding that back into our S&T and our development programs, whether it be in the military or in the commercial side, so that they can get improved systems earlier in the process. Because if we wait, it costs the Army a lot more money. Third, as we get into the acquisition, or fourth, as we get in the acquisition process, these data that we generate are used to feed analysis of alternatives. Again, um, there are analyses that other Army analysis agencies do but we feed them the data. And then finally, it's all about the warfighter. And so a very important part of our campaign is analyzing how the human actually interacts with the materiel, the training systems that they will have to use all throughout their, uh, their life cycle. I'll briefly mention the uh, network integration experiment. It's something that the Army does. We're about on our 10th one now where we take you know, large you know, brigade size element out and we look at our communications equipment, our network equipment, really put it through the paces in an operational sense. The tools coming out of this campaign, models, analysis techniques, the people who have gotten involved to look at things from a cyber point of view have given the Army great benefit, saved millions of dollars and greatly enhanced the robustness of those evaluations over the years. Our taxonomy, four major areas, um, assessing S&T, the S&T of assessment, assessing the mission capability of systems, and then systems capable of assessing missions. Let me start with the, with the green one. Our third one, that's where the preponderance, the majority of our work is today. Uh, the top three are core competency threat areas that we understand, ballistics, EW, and cyber. Uh, so we do a lot of assessment of systems. We work very closely with the other campaigns that you've been hearing about, whether they be lethality and protection, information sciences, computational sciences. Human systems, I mentioned, we work very closely with the human system campaign. And then reliability, availability, maintainability. It's not just understanding the threats, it's also you know, working with our maneuver campaign, understanding as we develop vehicles, as we develop new systems, will they be reliable? How do we assess that reliability? How do we assess the availability? And then finally, we don't put out individual systems. As General Wharton talked about this morning, it's science and technology, the capability. The capability depends on multiple systems, and we need to be able to assess how those systems interact and play together. So we have an effort looking at systems of systems. Briefly on the, briefly on the left, left hand side, I'll go down to the third box, vulnerability and assessment of analysis of technologies. Again, this is an effort where we're working with in industrial partners, working across DART-ECOM, working beyond DART-ECOM across the Army to bring in subject matter experts to look at low TRL systems while they're in development. These could be uh, you know, PNT, these could be communication systems, okay? We work with our analysis expertise with the technical experts to identify the shortfalls, and this is already starting to yield some benefits. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. Second, I mentioned validation and verification um, up there in the top in the blue. There's a poster upstairs that talks about uncertainty quantification. Um, these are very uh, complex analyses that we do. We need to understand where the uncertainties are. Finally, on the right-hand side, a lot of decisions today, the majority of decisions are made by people and we're giving them a tremendous amount of data. As part of the human analysis effort, you know, how can we develop systems which offload some of the, this capability and assist in making some of these decisions, whether that be a training system or another system. And then finally, you've heard several of our speakers today mention the Army operational concept. It speaks to unknowns in the future and the fact that we will not be able to know the future. It will be unknown unknowns, if you will. And it introduces the tenet of adaptability. As we go forward, we need adaptable leaders and we also need adaptable systems. So 
I'm putting the call out there, particularly to some of the big thinkers, if you will, about how do we actually analyze systems for adaptability? Okay, what can we do to analyze something where we can yet, we can't really define what the future is, what the threat will face? Interesting problem. Talk a little bit about the people. We have about 250 experts, if you will, spread across um, you know, the country, as I'll show you in a minute, and ARL. Uh, you know, working in this uh, area, mostly in our core competencies. There's another, well, a key thing about these folks is, yes, they have, they're highly educated, but what really they bring to the fight is an in-depth understanding of the systems that they're analyzing, plus they also understand the operational environment and the threat. So you understand the system, you understand the operational environment, and then they understand that technology is part of the system. Okay, so this is an expertise that you don't get coming out of school. It's an expertise you build up you know, by doing the analysis over the years and understanding how the Army fights, okay? This expertise does translate in other environments. I'll point out in injury biomechanics. You know, recently we were called in by another agency and some of our analysis experts were put the task, you know, in short order to assist this agency with a high profile, you know, accident event, you know, that occurred. I won't get into it because I haven't cleared it with them to discuss, but, you know, our experts you know, because of their analysis capability by looking at how the soldier might respond to a threat, we're able to go in and help another government agency. So there's opportunities uh, here for our folks to help out. Let's see, I'm supposed to point that up there. Okay, so you're here at Aberdeen Proving Grounds today. Um, however, uh, we are located with this campaign throughout the, throughout the nation. Uh, Aberdeen uh, is where most well, moved a little south. It's down around Indian Head now. But um, Aberdeen Proving Grounds is where most of our uh, ballistics uh, is within this campaign and our communications as well. Um, if you go, and a large part of our human sciences uh, effort. Uh, if you go down to um, Orlando, uh, Simulation Training Technology Center, so um, part of our analysis campaign is centered down there. And if you go out to White Sands, uh, you know, we have a whole division out there focused on cybersecurity and electromagnetic warfare, so there's a lot of capability in, I guess, what we heard one of the speakers call the flyover area uh, this morning. So, uh, you know, next to the uh, Arizona flyover area, there's um, a lot of capability in New Mexico as well. Some example of facilities. Um, again, talk to our folks. There's a lot more than just this. I can only highlight so much on one chart. The top center is a unique facility we have where we're actually able to take a full up army rotorcraft while it's running, put it on a test stand, elevate it up to about 30 degrees, and then run it through its paces in some threat environment. For example, we have developed the capability, somebody spoke to our you know, technical capability earlier, we developed the capability to put a bullet on a specific location on the rotor blade while it's spinning. And then watch how that damage cascades through that vehicle, working with other folks in the lab, understand the effect of that vehicle and then the flight character, effect of that damage on the flight characteristics. So these are some unique capabilities. And that's just emblematic of the types of things that we can do. Electro-optical vulnerability assessment, that's out at uh, White Sands. We look at low to mid-energy lasers. Uh, currently we're up in the eight to 10 uh, you know, kilowatt range. A lot of work looking at um, optical augmentation, um, as, as well as other vulnerability for la laser vulnerability. Another thing we bring to the table there is we do the modeling, looking at both the macro and micro optical components and how those lasers propagate through the optics. Electronic warfare, um, communications, RF propagation, signal propagation, understanding different waveforms. We bring in military systems, commercial systems, understand how they respond uh, to various threats, to various waveforms, and how the communications um, may or may not work. Electromagnetic Vulnerability Assessment Facility, it's another facility that's out at White Sands. Uh, what you're looking at there is a picture of one of our anechoic chambers. This particular one is 110 feet by 70 feet by 40 feet. It's very large. Uh, you can bring in uh, an M1 tank, a 100 ton turntable. You can bring in a Patriot radar and put it through its uh, electromagnetic warfare paces in there. Um, we can bring in systems and simulate uh, very complex electromagnetic effects. Um, you know, on commercial hardware as well as military hardware. It's a very powerful um, asset that we have. Ballistics experimentation, you heard in the previous speaker talked about some of the uh, ballistics capability you have within ARL, so I won't mention too much, but we do a lot on personnel protective equipment and then working across the lab, 
we have asset, you know, we have a access to all the facilities across the lab, any of us do. Um, you know, it's small arms through large cal, through, ex you know, explosive events, um, all kinds of complex capability. It looks like I stumped it. Okay, there you go. Uh, so an example of what we do in ballistics, um, injury uh, mechanisms. This is just a few examples. Uh, so in the area of injuries, um, we need to really understand the fundamentals of what manifest from threat to an injury in a human, and then how can that human respond once they are incapacitated or injured, okay? Um, so we have a model called ORCA, which looks at all this. Uh, this is based on, you know, fundamental understanding, uh, you know, whether it be a penetrating injury, a blunt trauma injury, accelerative injury, uh, you know, a blast load coming up, you know, through a boot. We also do flame and thermal. So um, that's an important area for us, an area we're looking to collaborate uh, with others. I mentioned these models are complex. If you go to the middle there, uh, you know, these are very complex models and the threat gets a vote. So we might set up a well-controlled experiment, but then when you get out into the field, that's not necessarily what we're going to see. So we have to iterate on these models, run them in the Monte Carlo simulation over and over again on some very complex Army systems. This drives the need for some really high performance software and some uh, good techniques to get answers very efficiently for our evaluators. So there's opportunities to collaborate you know, in the modeling and simulation as well. And then finally on the right hand side, I mentioned the experiments can be very difficult. So we're looking for innovation to actually how you measure things and what we'll find frequently is people will come in to get some measurements and you know we'll get better measurements but they'll learn something about their system which they can take back and influence their design. Some examples in electromagnetic warfare. I mentioned already that we do a lot of work in laser protection. Um, you know, so we're doing hardening of optical electromagnetic systems, trying to analyze that and then understand you know how a system could be improved to a variety of laser threats moving forward. Assessments of military and commercial hardware. That's a picture of multiple uh, GPS systems in our electromagnetic vulnerability assessment facility. Um, you know, I, and I say GPS, but you know, it's GPS, it's GLONASS, it's Galileo. You know, we can simulate the satellites, you know, so, and then we can run the models as well um, you know, for that. So there's a lot of potential there for what we do in electromagnetics. If you think back to the network integration evaluation that I spoke about, on the right-hand side, a large part of that is as these units move, how do the communications, you know, withstand, you know, the movement and then the threat environment that may be, they may be exposed to. So we've developed some models and we're continuing to try and enhance these models that actually look at electromagnetic propagation, which translates into communication propagation um, as well. And so we've done some models there. Um, we can look at how the signals bounce off of mountains, but then we're also moving into urban environments and looking at, you know, complex multipath uh, effects in urban environments as well. So how do we come, how do we work with people today out of this campaign? Well, first of all, we have a lot of extreme events where we run some uh, very good experiments. When you think about physical experiments, we certainly do that in the blast sense, in the injury sense. Okay, but there's also some extreme environments in cybersecurity where we put things through their paces. Um, you know, extreme just doesn't mean the physical, it also means the cyber. And we're teaming with universities, both in the medical area as well as in the cyber area. Um, so there's opportunities there as well as the other core competencies that we work. Joint analytical software creation. Okay, so we've um, engaged with partners with some of our in-house code and we've gone out and uh, worked with folks on the outside to you know, get improvements to the speed of our codes. Um, so we're doing some work there as well. Early assessment of commercial technology. I was just looking at a program the other day where we had three different vendors and we were running their technologies through as part of a development uh, program. So um, real opportunities there to add some benefit. And then finally, equipment manufacturers. Uh, you know, when you get higher up into the TRL process, we'll actually bring their equipment in and want to use our facilities because we can put things through the paces in ways that you, you know, maybe can't at an OEM uh, facility. So there's some opportunities there as well. I think we have 26 posters in the two rooms. I've had them binned by taxonomy area here, um, but I encourage you to go up, talk to the folks, engage them, 
uh, you know, things such as looking at intelligence agents for the cyber domain in terms of how we assess science and technology, systems to systems down there under systems capability to assess mission. Uh, our virtual tours, I should mention, on the bottom. Um, you won't, the tours don't go by some of our facilities, but we do have some virtual tours which give you more detail uh, about what happens at some of our range facilities up the, upstairs. And then the preponderance of our posters are in the area of uh, mission uh, uh, assessing systems capability and mission. So uh, more posters. And then my final slide. Again, um, you know, we can talk technology, but I really want to, I want to hear from you in terms of, you know, what you need in the area of analysis and assessment. You know, talk to our folks. Um, if they're giving you a data dump, about what they've done in the past, that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, hopefully you'll understand what their challenges are and they'll listen to you and you can understand what their challenges are. Um, so let's listen, let's learn. I like my coffee black, I like my napkins clear so I can come up with some ideas and then you know, we'll use our tools and try to get something done together. Thanks and I welcome any questions that you have.